Welcome to lecture five of the test design course. Today we focus on domain testing. This is the most widely taught and probably the most widely used software testing technique. We've seen parts of it already under the names boundary and equivalence class analysis. Over the past 20 years, my biggest challenge in teaching domain testing is that students think they understand it as soon as I explain the basic idea. Now that might not sound like a big problem, but it is because the students understand less than they realize. They do understand it well enough to describe the concept or pass a simple multiple guess test. But when I give them exercises that require them to apply the technique, they have more trouble than they expect. Samia Padmanabhan did her master's thesis research on the teaching of domain testing. She demonstrated that the technique is more cognitively complex than we expected. Despite its apparent simplicity, it involves a remarkably diverse collection of skills and concepts. Samia, Doug Hoffman, and I are presenting a collection of worked examples in the Domain Testing Workbook. We've been writing this for about five years. It's going to become the textbook for the Domain Testing course. Today's lecture traces the surface of what we plan for the full Domain Testing course. My goals for today are to familiarize you with the traditional approach so that you can apply it to the straightforward cases on your own, and to introduce you to the concepts of input variables versus result variables and primary dimensions versus secondary dimensions. These are fundamental distinctions in domain analysis, but they're rarely taught explicitly. And finally, to introduce you to a schema, a generalized approach for applying domain testing to many different types of variables. Let's start with a simple field and a simple dialogue. This is the page width field in PowerPoint. So how wide can a slide be? Well, I don't know. That is, I don't see a specification that tells me how wide a slide can be. It's not in the help. I don't see it in the user documentation. Ranges of valid values for a variable are often undocumented. Some testers complain about this. Some testing consultants will tell you to insist that programmers specify these details for you. But in my experience, I can only make a limited number of demands in a project. There's only so much I can insist on. It's like a magic genie who'll grant you three wishes. After three, no more wishes. If the programmers don't include details like these in the specification, I can certainly ask whether they have time to fill in the missing information. But if they say no, they don't have that time. Or if they promise the information later, I have to consider whether I want to spend one of my three wishes on this or save my demands for something that would be harder to figure out on my own. In my experience, too many conflicts between test groups and programming groups are caused by testers demanding too much work that the programmers believe the testers could just as easily do for themselves. Now, I'm not talking about who's right or who's wrong here. What I'm saying is the programmers are overworked too. If they think you're asking for too much, they're going to come to resist giving you anything, even information that you can't possibly get for yourself and that you absolutely need. For ranges of variables, if no one has specified these for me, I can try the program myself and see what happens. This will give me my own list of ranges. Now, if the, if the values in the ranges seem unreasonable, I can write bug reports. I can also schedule a review meeting with project manager or programmer to go over my analysis of lots of variables at one time. This is not a perfect solution, but perfection takes time. The programmers and the testers need that time for other, harder problems. So what's the biggest number I can enter into this field? I'll try 999. PowerPoint doesn't like 999. I give it that number, it gives me back 56. So I'm going to tentatively accept 56 inches as the limit. That means I'm going to assume, for now, that 56 inches is the widest slide that PowerPoint can create. Now PowerPoint's default slide size is 7.5 inches tall and 10 inches wide. If I change the width to 56 inches, the slide gets wider. That's what it's supposed to do. 56 is the biggest width that I can specify for the slide. But what's the widest number I can use to specify the width? How many digits? 56 is two digits. So what about three digits? Well, I'm not going to try 56.1 because it's just going to take that back to 56. So I'm going to try 10.1. And if I try that, PowerPoint makes the 10.1 inch wide slide just a little bit bigger than the 10 inch, like it's supposed to. And when I try 10.12, PowerPoint makes it a squinch wider than 10.1. But when I try 10.123, I don't see a change. And when I go back to the page setup dialog, I see that PowerPoint has changed the width from 10.123 back to 10.12. However, PowerPoint rounds 10.129 to 10.13. 
So even though it displays at most two digits after the decimal point, it must be interpreting more of the digits that I entered, at least three digits after the decimal, or it couldn't be doing this rounding correctly. I've now discovered four apparent facts about the product's design. 56 appears to be the maximum width. The program lets me enter numbers bigger than 56, but it changes those values back to 56. The field works with two digits after the decimal point. It accepts more than two digits, and it pays attention to more than two digits because it rounds up to a two-digit result. Now, is this how the program's supposed to work? I don't know. But having observed that this is how it seems to work, I can ask whether this is reasonable, whether it's consistent with how people will use the product, whether it's consistent throughout the product, and what the consequences are of these facts, how they'll impact other things that the program does. So even if you get nothing from the programmers beyond the code, you have your own knowledge and tools for evaluating the program's design details. You are not helpless without a specification. Now for the next step. The maximum page width is 56 inches. What's the minimum? It only takes a couple tests to establish it at one inch. From one inch to 56 inches, in increments of 0.01 inch, there are 5,601 possible page widths. There's very little value in testing all of these. What are you going to learn from testing 15.44 inches that you wouldn't have already learned from 15.43? Domain testing provides a sampling strategy for this. It provides heuristics for choosing a small number of tests that are powerful enough to represent the larger domain. Every function actually has two domains, an input domain and an output domain. In PowerPoint's page setup dialog, the set of numbers you can enter into the dialog are the input domain. The set of possible page widths is the output domain. Now you can focus on either domain with domain testing, and in either case, you're going to be doing both things. You're going to be entering inputs, and you're going to be observing the outputs. One of the key sampling heuristics in domain testing is equivalence. If two values are similar enough, only test one of them. Applying this to the page setup dialog, domain testers would typically treat every value from 1 to 56 as equivalent. Another key sampling heuristic is testing at the boundaries. If 1 and 56 are the smallest and largest possible values, test with those. One of the reasons we treat boundaries as special is that programmers often make coding errors right at the boundary. They might treat a value as good, even though it's barely outside the boundary, or they might treat a value as bad, even though it's barely within. Another challenge is that the designers can misunderstand the real world, and so they misspecify the boundaries. In this case, when the programmers code perfectly according to the design, they perfectly code the wrong boundaries. Along with testing values that belong in the input domain or the output domain, you should test values that don't belong in the domain, that are outside. The program should reject these as errors, but gracefully. PowerPoint rejects them by changing them. For example, it changes 0.99 inches to 1 inch. Glenn Myers presented a useful table for summarizing this analysis. The table distinguishes between invalid and valid values. We start with values that are too small. We show the definition of that set, every value less than 1, and we show the test case that we draw from that set, 0.99. Then we show the domain, which runs from 1 inch to 56 inches, and its tests, 1 inch and 56. Finally, there's the set of values that are too large. These are the ones bigger than 56. The test case is 56.01. Notice that on this table I put each test on its own line. Many people show all the tests and all the sets on one line. Myers demonstrated that. So did I in testing computer software. I did these tables that way in my day-to-day -day work for years. I really liked the approach because it was so concise. I could fit lots of analysis, lots of variables on one page. But time and again, I'd look at these equivalence class tables, at a table that somebody else had created, or even one that I created a year ago, and I'd get confused. It is much clearer to show your tests one per line in a way that ties each test specifically to the set that you chose that test to represent.